I want to talk about the creative process a little bit and give you my concept, my thought. Hopefully, um, I can inspire some th- something in, in you guys. Now, as some of you may know, I have an undergraduate and a graduate degree from Queens College, and I started going to the college in 1978. The college at that time was much less performance-oriented than it is now. What the school was much more focused on as an undergraduate was a really strict intellectual dive into learning music. So what do I mean by that? Well, we had five semesters of theory, four-part Bach chorales, species counterpoint, 12-tone music. I had class. I had George Pearl, who was a very famous American composer and uh, expert on music of Alban Berg. I had his last undergraduate class I was in. And, you know, he was incredibly intellectual and, you know, talking about tone rows and all sorts of, it was interesting, kept on denying mathematical um, relationships in music, but yet he was always talking about symmetrical subdivisions of the octave and using hexachords and and stuff. And then I had uh, two semesters of Shankerian analysis with Carl Schachter, one of the leading proponents of Shankerian analysis and a really great guy, um, a really great guy and a great musician. Yeah, and that was that. That's like an intense amount of work um, for undergraduates uh, uh, in terms of theory, and actually, it probably it's more theory than some Ivy League graduate students were were taking uh, at that time. And while I did well, I I enjoyed it, and I'm thankful to have it. There was, and I'm very fortunate that I had Professor Berkowitz as my main theory teacher, so I wasn't really stuck with some of the other guys there that were a little bit more by the book. Uh, I always found that there was a disconnect between studying this stuff and producing music, creating music. I I just, I, I just could never sit there with a pencil and paper and write something as creatively as I could just sitting down at the piano and improvising. It's just sort of the way my brain works and everybody's brain works in a different way. So the the big breakthrough for me was when I got a computer and I started even more than I started learning how to do te- music technology when I was in high school. We had a small music studio with a mini Moog and a four track and a spring reverb, you know, the size of a practice room, you know. Um, and I had synthesizers when I was playing in bar bands uh, in the in the late seventies and early eighties. And um, I actually one of the synthesizers I had, which was a Maxi Korg, I still wish I had because it was a really cool paraphonic two voice synth. Um, and I, I, I'm really, every once in a while, I kick myself for selling that. I don't even think I got that much money for it. So the, I started around 1984 or so. I was working in the city playing shows, and um, I started getting into, back into music technology a little bit more seriously at that point. And I bought a DX7, and I bought a, a Juno 106 by Roland and an Insonic Mirage, which was an 8-bit sampler. And I purchased a, a, like a rack mount a TX-816. Uh, it was a, a big box filled with racks of DX-7 modules. And I had a four-track cassette deck. And, I, and, I, and I, my first sequencer was a QX-21 by Yamaha. And it was a, uh, you could record 16 tracks on it, but only had two tracks The way that you get the second track would be to just play something on a different MIDI channel on the same track. Um, And it had a tiny little LCD that I had to do all the programming from. But that's where I started being able to capture things in a more spontaneous manner. And as time went on, 
I started getting more and more into sequencing, and I upgraded my sequencer twice. I purchased a, a QX5, which was a really nice hardware sequencer, but it didn't have any onboard storage. The way that you would store your pro projects would be with a, a crappy little mono tape recorder, and you would take an output of a sync tone like this. It sounds like almost like a a dial-up modem sound, and you just record it onto a cassette deck, and then you'd load it back in, and it was so hit or miss from my perspective. It was it was horrible. And then I purchased an MC50 by Roland. I jumped off the Yamaha bandwagon because it had a floppy disk drive, and I could store things right into a floppy disk drive, and that was much better. And, you know, even though those floppy disks were like two megabytes or two and a half megabytes or something like that, the sequences were... You could fit like 50 or 60 sequences onto one of those floppy disks. They took up very little memory, just like a doc, a Word document. And then around 1992, I purchased my first computer, and I started using this software called Stu Vision, and then that became Studio Vision. And that's where I ported all my hardware sequencing skills over to the computer, and that's when my creativity started really changing the computer i started thinking about the computer as like an instrument right or as a canvas so an artist takes a canvas and you know they create their palette of of tones that they're going to paint with or maybe they machine machine gun balloons of paint onto a big canvas or you know, they do a, a shaman dance over a canvas lying on the ground and do drip paintings a la Jackson Pollock. Um, but that canvas is like the, it's, it's, it's the foundation for their creativity because everything goes on there. And I started thinking of the computer as an extension of my creativity not as a computer, but as an instrument or a canvas. In other words, the computer is an instrument. How do I play that instrument, right? So once you start thinking about the computer as not this word pro glorified word processor, well, once I started doing that, right, I, it's, I started using sort of like my artistic creativity coupled with the software to enhance and create better stuff, better product. And it really, it really worked for me really well. Um, and it's still working for me now, 20, almost 20 years later or 30 years later with a computer. So, uh, you know, what was it about that? And what is it about me sitting at the keyboard and playing something that is, for me, so much more creative and musical than sitting there trying to craft something out with a pencil and paper? Now, don't get me wrong. There are times where I have to look at notation and figure things out and you know, calculate and create things. So I'm not dissing on create on, on on using manuscript paper. Some of you are working, and you've always worked writing music to uh, paper on onto paper, and that's fine. But you know, if you think about Asian Indian musicians, somebody let's say somebody's going to learn how to play the tablas. they don't sit there and play the drums for a couple of years. They learn how to count and sing all of the rhythms for a couple of years before they actually start touching the drum. And why is that, right? Why don't they start learning their, the rudiments and all this other technical things about playing the tabla? Well, it's because they're internalizing the language of the drums, the language of their polyrhythms, the language of their complex meters. 
they're internalizing all that. So that when they combine that with physically playing the drum, there is no, very little separation between the doer and the deed, right? You're the person who's doing something and it's creating a sound. I might have mentioned this before in this class or in another class, but I was, I like to listen to other musicians talk. There's a great uh, Harvard lectures, a bunch of them by Herbie Hancock, all sorts of incredible anecdotes and thoughts on things and stories about miles and creativity. And it's great. Chick Corea is another one who can tell some interesting stories. And these people are, We've been I've been blessed to have these people in my entire life to listen to their music and, and study and enjoy it. And, um, you know, they're not going to be around forever, sadly. But they're still vital, both of them. I saw Chick Corea play like, uh, I don't know, three, four, three years ago at the Blue Note. It was, um, it was one of his birthday party or something like that. And his playing was just still superb, superb. And he's in his 70s, uh, mid-70s. But Chick was doing an interview with somebody, and somebody had to ask him, well, what do you think about when you play? And Chick said, nothing. I try to think about nothing when I play. And that's interesting, because a lot of us have been taught to hear something in your head and be able to play it, right? But he's, he's he, and I'm sure that there are times that he does that. But for him, the, the connection between doing something and the end result, he doesn't want there to be his conscious mind getting in the way, criticizing, commenting, having an opinion, right? He just wants to be. So from my perspective, the way I look at it is that creating music for me is a very spiritual and personal endeavor. Even if I'm doing a commercial project, right? Even when I was playing on Broadway, the same music every night, sometimes music I did not like. I had to get myself into a zone because I was hired to do a job and there were people on stage that were re relying on my piano playing. The conductor was relying on my piano playing. There were 1,750 people in the Broadway theater for 10 years every night that paid lots of money. And for them, it was a big deal, even if it was just another gig for me. And they had to be given the same care on show 2,050 as show 10 or show 3,500 as show 10 or 9 or 8, right? So with that being said, that music is a very personal and spiritual endeavor to me, the way I look at it is that anything you want to create is, is there. It's there. And if you get out of the way and just trust yourself to let it happen, it's almost like when you're, when I'm creating, I'm almost separate from my body, looking down on myself and observing and not commenting, not criticizing, not having an opinion. When I'm done, I might have an opinion. Now, does that happen 24-7, 365? No. That's the goal, and that's the best outcome that you can have. You become your whole being 
becomes a vessel for the creative force to go through you and come out in sound. You close, you just open your mind, stop thinking, quiet, you turn off the radio, you turn off the TV, you, sign, you turn off Wi-Fi, you get off the internet, you close out all your browsers, you know, you just shut everything out. Take a few minutes to breathe, get in the zone, and just sit back and observe and let it happen. Now, I do that when I'm playing. You don't have to be playing an instrument to do that. You, you can do that with your ideas as you're developing ideas. You're still just in a flow and working and not really, and, and trying to become unconscious, right? Dis, disassociate your rational mind from the act of creating and just observe. Now, that's much easier said than done. The hard part becomes all of the work you have to put in to get to that point, right? Because even though what I just said sounds like mumbo jumbo, there is a lot of mechanical work that goes on into that for me. What is that mechanical work, right? That mechanical work is spending time every day playing something slowly in time in all, tw in all 12 keys, right? Chord voicings, lines, rhythms, that's sort of part of my daily routine at the instrument. If it's only a half, if at this point I can do that for about if I get an hour to an hour and a half every day in on the piano about half an hour is spent doing that stuff every day right and I do it hands separately hands together um, and I just pick something and I just work it for a half an hour slowly do some variations on it and when you start transposing things to all 12 keys what happens is that music stops becoming an intellectual exercise and more, I can just put my hands there and they know where to go because I've practiced these things over and over and over again. And it does sound like a contradiction that I'm doing all this rote work, but I'm also practicing my breathing when I'm doing these. I'm practicing keeping my mind quiet. I'm practicing, I'm practicing multiple things at the same time, right? I'm getting some digital dexterity. I'm learning how to not think about keys because I'm playing in all 12 keys. And I'm learning, I'm, I'm uh, gaining harmonic um, vocabulary, melodic vocabulary. And I'm internalizing all that stuff. And the, the, the point becomes that it just becomes so much a part of you that you don't have to think. You can just do. You don't have to think what the fingering is. You can just play something, right? But it's the careful and deliberate study of all these concepts over time doesn't happen in a day, doesn't happen in a week. Over time, these things become part of your performance mechanism. And you learn how to trust them after a while. And so, does that mean that I never think when I'm working? I think. I think plenty. But there are moments where the creative thing is happening right at the beginning. 
then I might have to sit back and listen and, and think about what I've done and see how I can enhance that. And then I, I can get into like the physical mechanics of things and the calculation of how should I orchestrate this? You know, what if I want to double that, bring that melody out? I'll, I'll orchestrate it with the doubling it with another instrument. That's, that's sort of like more, you know, like that's more traditional thinking. But it's, it's that, it's, it's that initial spark I always find is best doing this. You know, there's a, I wrote this theme song for, um, it was Comcast Sportsnet. Um, it's for their sports night in 2007. And I used to live on York Avenue and 82nd Street. And I, I would walk from there down to 49th Street and 8th Avenue every day because I was renting a room in a larger studio to work in. And I wrote this tune, just singing it in my head all the way down there. When I got into the studio, I quickly put down a demo of it. And then like six months later, this job opportunity came up and I submitted it and they loved it, right? I, 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 I took that basic idea and I, I worked it up and I made it really sound good instead of just having a, a rough sketch down there. And the thing's been on the air for 13, 14 years. Uh, I sold the rights to it a few years ago when I sold my whole catalog, but um, it, it, it's just, it, it's, it, it, it just worked. It stayed on the air. They didn't take it off the air and it was very, it was very um, lucrative for me. But the deal is I was walking and not thinking. I didn't, I wasn't touching an instrument. I was just, the music was just coming out. And the way I remembered it was I sang it into the phone, uh, uh, on the, my, my cell phone. Um, Yeah, and the same thing happened when I wrote the FIFA World Cup theme. I, I just was, I had this, this like four hour, I don't know what was going on. I was working and next thing I knew it was four hours later, I had this track like almost finished, you know, like, and then with like reworks and then I had to, I got, got a vocalist to sing uh, something on it and I had to play some guitar parts, everything. It, it took like eight hours from beginning to end and, and like that went on air, just got mixed and the horns got replaced with live players. But basically everything I played there didn't get changed. You know, and it was just one of those moments, and these things happen. And for me, the, the side benefit of that is it actually feels really good, too. You know, it's not a struggle to create. You know, it's not like this thing where, oh, my goodness, I have to, I have to work so hard, and I'm, I'm trying so hard. I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying, and I'm so tense and everything. And when you're tense like that and you're trying to create, you're never going to create because you're stopping the energy in your body with your tension. So anyway, I wanted to um, <laughs> I wanted to broach that subject to you after I've been hearing your music for so for so long now for this whole semester. Um, I think that for some of you, thinking a little less would be better for all of us. Not trying so hard would be better. Learning how to say more with less. Right? I mean, that's the whole Miles Davis thing, isn't it? I mean, B.B. King could play three note, a three-note riff and, like, it moves you to another planet. So... Learning how to do more with less, right? That brings us into atmospheric music. So I have, um, another thing I do is I put out albums. I've got, I don't know, like over a dozen albums out. Some of them are my film scores. Um, but I write this ambient, uh, orchestral, electronic kind of music sort of, some of it. And I think, uh, I forget when it was, I think it was like in the late 90s, I, I, some, somebody gave me uh, a Harold Budd album called Ambient Plateau, which was produced by Brian Eno. And I don't like the whole album, but there were like a few cuts on there. It was just, and I've talked about this before, and I'm going to go over this a little bit in a minute. 
he's he was a pianist. I think he studied at Mills College. I, I believe I've gone over this with you guys before. And he actually taught, I think, at, a, at Mills College or maybe at a college in Los Angeles for a while. And then he started getting into Terry Riley and Steve Reich and a lot of minimalist music. And it changed his whole way of creating stuff. Anyway, at some point in the mid to late 70s, he started hooking up with Brian Eno, who's a great record producer, creative thinker. And they started producing these albums together. Eno started doing these experiments with tape loops and he created um, ambient soundscapes, music for airports, right? So he just have these recordings, these like 30 minute recordings that would just play in an, on an endless loop to sort of like focus people and relax them as they're hu hu hurrying and scurrying around airports. Literally, one is called Music for Airports. Um, and I remember the first, I was in O'Hare once in Chicago and I heard it and I was, and I was like, yeah, it really does work. Uh, and they were playing it. So what Eno and Bud did though was Bud was sitting there practice playing the piano and he was going to record a solo piano music. And Eno took the signal from the piano and he put it through a bunch of processors. And at that point, they were, I believe they were early digital processors. You know, maybe it went through some eventide stuff and it went through an early lexicon and maybe some early delays. And he, you know, and some pitch shifting. And what Bud was doing was he was hearing this back in the headphones and not hearing really the piano anymore as he was playing it. He was hearing this treated sound. And he started improvising to this treated sound. And what happens is that you play a note and then there is a lot of other activity going on around the note that is being generated by these processing uh, units. And all that stuff is music, you know, it's, it's sound that's unfolding over time. Um, so we're going to take a look now at a track of mine um, that actually originated as a film score for a film I did for ESPN. But I turned it into an album track, and this gets airplay on Sirius XM quite a bit. Okay, let's do this. Let me leave the screen. So um, this was in a film called The Mighty Ruthie, which was about a, an ESPN documentary about this woman, Ruth. I can't forget what her last name was, but she was a, um, a co college uh, basketball star, and then she played in the WNBA and she had a situation with her ex-husband who was going to kill her with a gun. And this, you know, the whole, the whole story was about her career and then how she escaped from the marriage. And then she set up, now what she does is she's got this really incredible counseling situation for other women in abusive relationships. And it was a really inspirational story. And this piece sort of started, was the opening to the film and then it reprised several times uh, throughout the film. So let me just play this for you and then we'll go through what I'm doing here. Actually, can, let me do this one thing before we go on. Let's see. Inserts. Let me just turn the volume down on this over here so that it doesn't distort because it's a little, um, it's pretty dynamic. Here we go. So let me turn this down. 6 dB. All right, here we go.
All right. So when you're doing this kind of music where the harmonic motion is so slow, right? Like it doesn't change chords for like almost 60 seconds, right? You have to find ways to make the music unfold in a way where it, it keeps some sort of interest. Let me just gather a little more space on the edit window here. I don't need to see comments. And we can shut the tracks list. Great. So this there's a little tangential um, issue here that If you want to do this, you're going to have to start, sort of continually build up sound libraries that you can use. And it would be really advantageous to you if you learned how to make simple sampler instruments. Um, it doesn't have to be super programming, but if you have a friend who can play, let's say, violin, and they play you some live performances that you can record and you can play back on a keyboard or you can drop them in into a composition they will add something and it could be the kind of thing where they play a, a, a note for like 15 seconds and they change their bowing articulation right so that it's just a slow note and then it gets into a gradual tremolando and then slows down a little bit, right? So just things where the sound is unfolding and has some mo motion and is animated over time. I've made sounds like that and um, that's one of the great things about having analog synths like I've got here is they've got knobs and dials and sliders on them. So you can, in effect, when you're performing, you can do that at, to, to a sustained sound and have it unfold over time. And you could change the filter and the resonance, and then you could add some, some modulation to it, or, or you can have it affected by an LFO where it's pulsing or has a vibrato or, or it's got a tremolo, um, if you use a square wave, and all, all these ways of making a sound unfold over time. And that's sort of a different way of thinking about music than melody and counter melody or, you know, chords and harmonies, right? You have these arcs of sound that unfold and how you intertwine them together and where you place events on the timeline. That's a different way of thinking about music that's more visual because if you're watching a film, things are happening in a timeline and like, the camera might be moving and that sort of motion is like animating a sound or you might be zooming in or zooming out or doing a crossfade or you're doing, you know, a, a, like a wipe or, you, or you're doing a hard cut in the editing. And all these things create motion and animation to the visuals and where you place those events on the timeline will dictate in part the viewing experience of the audience and it's a similar thing here right where you place things on the timeline will help you unfold the narrative of this soundscape and that's a different way of thinking about music than song form got eight bars repeat it Eight bars, a half cadence, repeat it, got a full cadence, go to the bridge, then leads you back to the, you know, to the verse again, and then it's a, maybe a tag at the end, right? And it's 32 bars plus four on the tag or something. That's one way of thinking about music, and you should have that together. But this is a, a different way of thinking about music, and this is directly relatable to film scoring. So... Let's take a listen 
uh, to some of this. So this starts off with... Let me make these tracks a little bigger. Whoops, that's a little too big. <laughs> Just a single tone on a concertino strings. <coughs> Excuse me. And you can hear that as the sound is unfolding. Uh -huh. There's like a little pulse to it. And then it gets bigger, brighter. That's I'm drawing, when I was doing the MIDI, this is all MIDI, I was drawing all that stuff in, right? And then that gets mixed with this track here. So there's this event. And then a second event comes in. Right up a little harmony note. And then you hear how the timbre of that sound unfolds over time. We'll get to the voice in a minute. And then, um, I've got a guitar and two different piano tracks. Right, so that's an open voicing on the guitar. It's, a, it's an open C chord moved up a whole step so that it's a D with some open strings, which I think gives it a little bit of a suspended sound. And then I've got that going through a bunch of processing. So if I mute all the processing on the guitar, this is what I'm playing here. Yeah, you can't even hear that, right? <laughs> so the first thing I do is I add it to the saturation knob. Gives it a little gain. And then I go through this amp plugin. And then I directly plug this reverb into it. which makes it sound like it's a little further away, gives us a little distance, and then it's going through a delay line, which is... Huh, that's not it. I think it might be going through this, let's see. Oh, it's, oh I see. So it's going through two different delays. It's going through this Bucket Brigade delay on the left, and then another one on the right that's got a different time so that the both sides are different. One is probably a quarter note, one is probably a dotted eighth note with a lot of echo, a lot of repeats, and then a pitch shifter to make a little bit thicker. You hear that wow, wow. And then a delay, another delay. And so I took a very simple guitar passage, very simple, hold on. Just something like this. Right, very simple. And, oh, come on, get in there. Um, very simple, and through processing, I created like an like a, a like an event, right? It's almost like a a lot of things are happening now. Right, that's an atmosphere. I took a very simple guitar part and I processed it. And then that fits in with the piano, these two keyboards. Oh, the, okay, so it's it's coming up. One, two, three, and
right? That low note. So you see how that's all coordinated together and that's calculated and that's planned out, but it, these events happening at various points and they sort of like interlock together, right? So you've got this phrase and then a little, this high chord comes in and then they got an answering phrase and then a low note. And then that goes along with um, the unfolding string sounds. And then a voice comes in. This is, uh, her name's Joy Askew, and um, she used to play with Joe Jackson and Laurie Anderson and Peter Gabriel. She's a really, really great singer and songwriter, and she plays keyboards really well. But this has got a lot of processing on it. Got it going through a tape delay, a e couple of EQs, compressor, micro shift to change the, like, so you've got her voice, and then one slightly, slightly, slightly out of tune to make it thicker, and then some compression and reverb plugged into the track, and then, hold on, I'll mute these guys. So this is... And then that goes through a vocal delay. Right? And then through a very large hall. And you could see that it continues on after she stops singing. So this is all, everything that we're doing, I'm doing here is very simple, right? It's not simplistic, but it's simple. And it's a lot of simple ideas that unfold over time. And they sort of, I'm placing these little tasty nuggets at various points. And that gives you sort of like a progression of time and events happening. And this is one way that you create ambient music. So this is a choir sound here. I believe this is the track. This is sampled choirs. Right, so that, again, you see how that's all ch that unfolds that sound and it gets louder and it also gets brighter. So each one of these events becomes like a character in a play and they repeat like the low note on the piano, the little stabby chord, the choir, the vocal thing, the unfolding strings, and you place them throughout the timeline as if they're coming back onto the stage of a play, right? So they take on almost like a visual effect when you're writing. Let's go a little further. So then I've got this horn thing here. which is a sampled uh, French horn. And then I've got an ARP, uh, three tracks of ARP synthesizer. And in the track that sounds like this. And that's doubled with a cello.
Now, let me just show you a little trick here. If you're doing this in a, in a, in a computer, you see this track here, these are, these are automation, volume automation to make it phrase. Right, so again, as the track is moving forward, there are things that are happening to change the sound o over time. And all these things are sort of interwoven together. They're, they're, um, they weave in and out and it's... It's, it's an, not a difficult piece of music. There's not a lot of heavy counterpoint. There's not a lot of fast flourishes. There's not a lot of notes. But it's not simplistic. But can you write a piece of music with such slow harmonic rhythm and have it be a viable track, right? It's a skill. And you have to just practice it and then develop it. Let me just see if there's anything else. Right, so I've got this section here where I've got a little bit of a pulse and got a kick drum. Let's see, her voice is going post fader, so a pre fader, so you're going to hear it no matter what I do. Right, so it's like a heartbeat, that low kick. And right, and that comes in here. Right, and that's doubled with, right, so this is doubled with the low note on the piano. Right, so that gives it a nice little punch. And the reason I added that piano in there was so that you could hear the heartbeat and yet something would, it would be that brightness and heart, little um, raspiness on the piano there from the way I played it is helping that sound cut through the mix a little bit without turning it way up. Right, so finally, you know, I changed, actually the first chord change, yeah, it happens like a minute and 20 seconds into the piece, right? And it's just going to a four chord. Let's take a listen to the strings, what I'm doing here. All right, let's listen to this. Right, so literally, it's all about how the sound unfolds over time rather than melodic motion. And again, this is a skill that can be very useful to you in composing film music. So any questions on any of this so far? I've been talking almost nonstop for an hour, <laughs> um, just pontificating. I, I, you know, a little question might be a nice break. I have a question about the guitar sound. Uh, do you always design the sound in the program? Or no. No, you know what happened was that um, when I was writing the film score that this came from, uh, I wasn't in my home, and I didn't have a guitar amp with me, so I just plugged it directly into the my audio interface, and I recorded the guitar uh, right into the computer without an amplifier. I've got... I typically use a guitar amp going through a speaker uh, simulator and then into right into Pro Tools. Uh, nothing like the sound of a really nice tube amp. I've got a Mesa 
uh, a Mesa amp down there that really sounds great, and I've got um, I've got a few guitar amps. So no, not always. I've got car- guitar pedals. I, I make the sound before I put it into a computer a lot. But for this particular project, uh, yes, I I com- I worked on it inside the computer. I have a question. Yes, sir, Dimitri. Do you mix while while producing, or do you? Right. So, uh, mixing is part of writing for me. Right. Not final mix, but I want to get a good idea of what the piece is going to sound like. So I'm balancing. I'm panning. I'm adding effects. Um, I might not go crazy with EQ and compression as I'm working. Uh, if there's an issue or I want to do a sound design thing with like uh, getting rid of a lot of low end uh, with a high pass filter or something like that, or if I want to get rid of a lot of high end with a low pass filter, or if I hear something clashing and I want to just carve out some frequencies between a couple of instruments, I'll use EQ and some compression. But uh, generally for the music I write, it's mostly about getting my balances and my ambiences uh, right. You know, like I, I like in... in um, when you were taking Audio MIDI 2, I, I think I probably said that the most important thing about mixing music is vo- volume balancing. And that can be thought of on many different levels. The, the volume of a, an individual sound, the volume of a sound in a mix when it fits in with other instruments, um, uh, the volume of a frequency on a mix, that's EQ, right? Uh, if you do compression, it's like an automatic volume control. So a lot of, uh, and, and panning is volume because you're just having the volume of a sound come out of one speaker or the center or the other speaker or somewhere in between. So like one of the most important things from my perspective about mixing is vo- getting your volumes of all these things to work together. And so I'm doing that while I'm writing. And that's not something that you do in a notation program, right? The notation program is great, if, especially if you want to have other players play um, what you've written. But this is a performance, you know? That's the, the deal, is I'm trying to capture a performance as I'm writing, as opposed to writing a roadmap and having somebody else perform it for me. And, and both things are valid. It's just that uh, most film composers... Um, most film composers... Uh, work in the box like this they don't work in pro tools but they'll logic cubase whatever reaper some people work in in pro tools okay great so i'm going to close this out